Hey, Beachside, good morning. Um, one more time, um, one last time, hopefully, from Germany. Um, this morning I uploaded uh, last week's sermon, so it is July 23rd, and uh, yesterday I uploaded the, or actually I recorded the sermon for July 5th, and this morning I uploaded it, and uh, that was kind of a disaster, so I'm trying to get this uploaded as soon as I can. Um, that way, whenever I get out of here, I know that my sermons for the beginning of July have been uploaded. Um, as you hear this sermon, so on July 12th, as you are at FPC, I hope, uh, listening, um, I should be near the end of my time at Fort Bliss. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it depends on when we, we live here. Um, but if I am, even if I'm not, I guarantee you I will be tired and uh, ready to get home. Um, of course, that's if, that's if everything goes as planned. Um, as I mentioned in last week's sermon, um, that is no longer given in the world we're in. That is no longer given, and that, that's okay. Um, but uh, this sermon will have been uploaded in faith that gets to Dropbox and that I get to Texas and that there isn't another natural disaster that keeps you from coming to worship. Now, speaking of that, um, I saw on the news that there's this cloud of dust coming over the ocean from Africa, like sand and dust and that sort of thing. Um, that's going to hit Florida. And of course, of course that would happen in 2020. Why wouldn't it? <laughs> so it doesn't surprise me. Um, the upshot of this apparently um, is that it makes hurricanes harder to form. Um, I hesitate to say that because I could just see that happening in the three weeks between recording this and you seeing it. So I'm just waiting like, you know, July 12th when you should be watching this. There'll probably be like hurricane whatever off the coast of Florida that... I'm not even going to joke about that. Let's just hope that you're sitting at FPC watching this and there are no further issues. So on we go. Um, last week, um, or for me yesterday, I spent some time laying out five challenges facing us as a culture. Um, I say culture because uh, some of these challenges are unique to the 21st century in the United States. Um, yesterday, or June 22nd in real time, I spent about an hour and 15 minutes on a video chat with Santos um, from Nepal. Some of you remember he was a pastor. Um, our team spent quite a bit of time with. He was our translator and uh, and uh, in many ways our guide when we were in Nepal. And he and I have stayed close in touch and support each other spiritually. And um, we, um, we have uh, regular uh, video chats uh, just to catch up and spend time in prayer together and to find out you know, what's going in his life, what's going on in my life, and, and that sort of thing. Um, so in Nepal, they have very different challenges and constraints than our challenges and constraints um, here in the United States. So hopefully this sermon, looking at our challenges right now contextually, what is it that, that we're being challenged with? I'm hoping it's going to be absolute, in, obsolete or absolute, maybe both, but I meant obsolete. Um, in the next 10 to 15 years. I'm, I'm not holding my breath, but I'm hoping that some of what we talk about uh, will be obsolete. So what I want us to think about is we're called to engage the world. If you remember the sermon I preached, it would have been probably early June, about reconciliation. We were reminded or, or taught in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we are to be ambassadors of Christ and we're called to the ministry of reconciliation. And that ministry calls us to engage the world around us without becoming the world around us. Um, that's not an easy balancing act. We engage the world around us without becoming the world around us. With that said, what I want to do is build upon last week's message, which was called World on Fire, and understand uh, the roles that are uh, that Christ, that our faith, that our ministry, um, the roles um, those all play in speaking to these challenges. In doing so, what I'm going to do is continue last week's style which is not simply taking a section of scripture and unpacking it. That is um, my preferred method of preaching. I think it's a, a better, for the most part, better method of preaching. Um, but there are also times where you speak contextually about what it is a congregation is facing. I, I think the example I used yesterday was um, a church might open up a new sanctuary or a new building or uh, start a new ministry or whatever. And the pastor or the preacher will then talk about that. And it's okay to speak to contextual challenges and, and not try to kind of pigeonhole in, in a verse. But my regular sermon style is to unpack a, a message, um, seeking to interpret a passage rather than just giving you deep thoughts with Pastor Christian time. 
These are unusual times, however, and we're gonna speak specifically um, to those uh, contextual concerns. And do that, I'm gonna use one more verse to kind of um, launch from it and get us thinking, uh, which we studied in our uh, Wednesday evening Bible study, um, specifically John 8, 12, so just one verse, um, in which Jesus, this is Jesus speaking as, as John writes, he says, um, it's, or John writes, and again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is light. Jesus, or light, well, in Jesus, but light brings vision, warmth, and life. It's incredible what a difference light makes when you've gone without light. One of my uh, guilty pleasures uh, is the song Mr. Blue Sky by Electric Light Orchestra. Anybody who knows uh, my love of that song is going to roll their eyes and think, oh, he's talking about that song. But it's a song that, that um, comes from 1977, so what, 40, so 43 years ago. And uh, I've liked the song for a while, but it, it took on new meaning when I read the backstory about a year ago. It was before I, I came to Germany, so probably a year, year and a half ago. The front man of the band, Jeff Lynn, um, wrote the song, and he was locked away in, in a Swiss, Swiss, I can't say that, Swiss chalet, Swiss chalet trying to write. And, and here's what he says about that period. He says, it was dark and misty for two weeks, and I didn't come up with a thing. Suddenly the sun shone and it was like, wow, look at those beautiful Alps. I wrote Mr. Blue Sky and 13 other songs in the next two weeks. So in Florida, we're used to the sun. We, we, there's not, um, it's not by mistake that Florida is called the Sunshine State. But having been in Germany, and um, by the time you view this, it should be past tense. Um, having been in Germany, I can relate to that. It will be gray and rainy here for long stretches. Um, you know, for much of spring, it was, it was beautiful. Um, you know, 60, 60, 65, 70 degrees, sun shining. Actually, a day very similar to what we have today, which is technically now summer. And um, then there can be periods where you don't see the sun for a week or two at a time. And it'll be gray and rainy and 50, 55 degrees for long stretches. And so... When the sun comes out in those moments, when the light shines, there is this, this childlike exhilaration um, that I can see and relate to in the song, Mr. Blue Sky. So Jesus is that light, but even more so. His presence brings vision, warmth, and life in a way that we can't possibly imagine when we don't have it. So today, what I want to do is mix metaphors with that a little bit. Last week, we talked about the world being on fire, and today we're going to kind of metaphorically speak about quenching that fire. And here's where the metaphor gets mixed up. Uh, to quench it will take the light and presence of Christ. Okay, so to quench the fire will sort of counterintuitively require the light and presence of Christ, first in our lives as individuals, but then collectively as we engage and love the world. So I want to begin with a review of the, the challenges I laid out from last week, um, or in my time, yesterday. In order, uh, challenge number one is we doubt each other. Uh, we have taken to dismissing people and their feelings and their concerns. Uh, we, we may have legitimate policy, political, religious, philosophical disagreements with them, but we now doubt them and dismiss them in a way that's not healthy. Uh, the second challenge is that we're easily triggered, um, whether it be somebody on the right or somebody on the left or even somebody in the middle. We see something we don't like and we, we, we sort of knee-jerk react and we want to excise that or cut it out of our lives. Uh, challenge number three is we've got an upended social order um, where the nuclear family, which used to be at the, the center of, of, of sort of American society, uh, as well as law enforcement and reproduction and military, and there are just certain things that were taken for granted. They were just part of the, the social order, and all that's been upended or, or, or cast aside. The fourth challenge is that individualism is run amok. And so we are um, not just individualistic, which by itself isn't necessarily a bad thing, but we become that to an extent that it's not helpful. And then the, the fifth challenge specifically for the church is that we prefer the gospel. And so we turn Jesus um, crucified for our sins, bringing us into a life-giving, life-giving life and life-sustaining relationship with God. We, we've turned it into a weight loss plan or a means to prosperity or fortune and fame or We've, we've kind of countered or tailored it to, um, to, to whatever we want in the moment. 
And so to each of these challenges, we have a message and we have words of hope. And what I want to do is to look at each challenge as an actual opportunity. And so we're going to tackle them in order. So the first opportunity in the face of doubting each other is to instead trust God and to love each other. And so in the midst of, of, of a very doubtful and dismissive culture, what we want to do is we want to first of all trust God. And then from that, that trusting, loving relationship, we want to love each other. So critical thinking in this scenario doesn't disappear for the Christian. Having faith doesn't mean you have to slide into gullibility. And by the way, um, for many of you in Facebook, and I'm, I'm not exempting myself from this, I hope I, I, I do well with it, but you know, we, we, we share things, we retweet things, we, we just, without critically thinking, like, is this true? I mean, is what I'm sharing, the picture, the Bible verse, the political commentary, the whatever, is it true? Gullibility is not a mark of faith. So having faith doesn't mean you become gullible. In fact, it's, it's quite the opposite. It's, it's, it's because you understand the nature of sin. You understand that the heart can be deceitful. You understand that people will lie to advance their, their own cause or for personal gain. That, um, that causes you to have some caution. But here's the application for Christians. Rather than a slide in cynicism where you don't believe everything or you don't believe anything um, and, and, and you doubt people and you dismiss people, um, we begin by reaffirming our trust for God. And so think about what that means. We, we trust that God's plans are for good. We trust that, that God wins. We know he wins. We've got the rest of the story. The book of Revelation isn't meant to scare, and I'm not using this in, in the curse word, but the book of Revelation isn't meant to scare the hell out of you. It, it's to give you encouragement that God wins. If you are in Jesus, he wins. Death does not have a sting. It does not have a hold over you. Heaven is a beautiful thing where there is no more crying, there is no more pain, there is more, no more suffering. And yet, it, it's funny how Revelation has been turned into sort of this, this, uh, this tool to, to beat people down and to get them scared. Um, God wins. You know, I, I, it, during this, this lockdown time, I've, I've had the, um, I don't think it's a pleasure, but I've had the opportunity on TV, they have old sporting events like on the Big Ten channel. Um, I've seen some of the old Badgers games. Um, I've seen some of the, the games of the World Series in 91 where the Twins won the World Series. And even though I know what's going to happen, you still find yourself sitting at the edge of the seat going, okay, I, I, we win this game. I know we win this game. But when your guy fumbles or there's an interception or they miss a tackle, you find this anxiety rising up. And, and the book of Revelation is sort of like knowing the end of the game. God wins. We, we know God wins. So the question is not whether or not God wins. Do you trust that? Um, God's love. God loves you. God loves you specifically. Do you trust that? And so trusting God and reaffirming that trust is holding on to this idea or these ideas that God's plans are good, that God wins, that God loves you. And then hearing that call to then love the people around you. You know, then if we, if we love people, we can distinguish between disagreement, which is legitimate, just because you, you love somebody doesn't mean you can't have legitimate disagreements on the size of government, the way to treat viruses, the um, best way to raise kids or receive an education. You can have legitimate disagreements about legitimate things while still not dismissing or doubting um, the, the personhood of the other person. We can and, and should disagree about certain things, but to dismiss another person is, a, is entirely different. So light shows things for how they actually are. Light shows us the sin and the brokenness in the world. It also shows us how much God loves the people of this world. So we need to love um, and, and, and um, God um, and, you know, and understand that Christ loved um, us and show the world it is possible to love another uh, person without labeling them or dismissing them. So that's opportunity number one. Uh, to reaffirm our, our, our trust in God and our, our love for the people around us. The second opportunity is we have an opportunity in the midst of a world on fire to demonstrate calm strength. And this is in opposition to this idea that we're easily triggered. So we have an opportunity to demonstrate calm strength as opposed to uh, this world where people are easily triggered. Um, Christians can and should be calm and strong. Uh, people say and do offensive things. Yes. Yes, they do. People say and do offensive things. Welcome to the world. Good job of noticing that. You, you have reached level two of the 100 levels of life. The call 
is to not lose it when they do. People say hurtful things. Yeah, that stinks. That's awful. People do offensive things. You don't agree with they disrespect the flag or they disrespect certain political movements left or right. Got it. Okay, but what about you? Are you able to demonstrate calm strength or are you easily triggered? And I think it's it's about keeping perspective, both both historical and theological perspective. Uh, so keeping perspective both both historically and theologically. Let me let me unpack each of those for a moment. Historical perspective. Have things been bad in the past? Yes, of course they have. In fact, I would argue much more so than they are now. And that's not um, dismissing present concerns. You, you can hear that as dismissing present concerns, or you can hear that as perspective. Has anyone else gotten tired of the commercials by companies showing all the amazing things people are doing in quarantine, like they're doing backflips or they're like hitting a golf ball from their kitchen and it bounces off walls and lands in a cup in their, their living room or their dog learns English or some crazy thing or, or whatever and, and they take videos and they upload it and then different companies have different commercials like, hey, thank you for being you in, in quarantine. And, and here's the thing. What are they recording that on? A phone. Virtually every American has a handheld computer that's vastly superior to even the best computers in the 90s. The 90s. Think about that. I'm recording this sermon right now on an iPhone. A two-year-old iPhone. And I'm going to upload it from Europe. And you're watching it in Florida. Yeah, the isolation has been awful. This is a difficult time. And it is a very real disease. Many, many Americans have lost their lives. But we have to keep some perspective. Yes, there will be mental health challenges stemming from um, this quarantine. We, we can't yet grasp their economic implications, their economic devastation. But friends, we have to maintain some perspective. And, and, and to put it more simply, um, Christians, when you are confronted with the current crises, are you going to ramp people up? Yes, this is awful. It's going to get worse. Everything's going to hell in a handbasket and we're going there with it. Or will you call me say, you know, this is tough, but we're going to get through it. We're going to get through it. It's a historical perspective. But even more important, theological perspective. What's going on here theologically? Is it not true that God is still in control? Is it not true that you were before and you will still die? And is it not true that we believe that death is not the end, that you will live again? Those, those uh, perspectives are even more important in, in, the face of, in the face of this crisis or a personal health crisis or a personal job loss or something like that. Um, sticking with the light metaphor, light reveals. It reveals the serious issues we have in our culture. We'll talk about more of that in a second. Um, but it also reveals the beautiful answers we have in Christ. It shows and reminds us that God is in control. Um, it also speaks honestly of our mortality. I wonder personally if a failure to engage death is one of the reasons we're so easily triggered. You're going to die. I, I, I'm not trying to be morbid, but it, until you understand that and, and then ask God, well, what, what then do you want me to do with the, the last six months of my life or the last six years or the last six decades or whatever? Because I, I'm preaching this to kids as much as the oldest among us. If you can't grasp that, if you can't grapple with that, wrestle with that, you're going to have a difficult time dealing with many of the realities of life. You know, think about um, this current health crisis. COVID is awesome. Awesome. That's a that's an unfortunate slip, and I'm 19 minutes in the sermon, so I'm not going to re-record it. It's awful. It is awful. What's awesome, and here's where I was going with that, is the resources we have to understand to track and to treat COVID. We didn't have even a, a few decades ago. We didn't have this in the 90s. We didn't have a lot of this technology in, in the 90s. But I wonder if, if, if that awesome technology hides the reality of death and by hiding it, we're just less able to deal with it in a, in a strong, calm manner. If you are terrified of death, you will be illogical in your response to some of what's going on. And I'm, I'm not talking about wearing a mask. I'm not saying you shouldn't wear a mask if you're calm and strong. I'm not saying you shouldn't wash your hands. I'm not saying you shouldn't take precautions, especially if you're older, if you're in an at-risk group. Take it seriously. 
But at the same time, understand that whether it happens when you're 14 or 94, we're going to die. And, and, and until us Christians, we come to, to grips with that and understand life in the light of God, um, we will be triggered every time somebody talks about this stuff. Light also reveals to us that death is not the end. So that gives us a choice. And it gives us an opportunity. We can be calm and strong in the face of death, or we can run terrified. So my question is, which will it be? So opportunity number three, then, is an opportunity for us to model community. We, we talked about the third challenge, which is that we've kind of upended culturally the social order. Um, and if this challenge, um, that the social order has been upended, and the current crisis, along with that challenge, hasn't taught us about the importance of community, you haven't been paying attention. The destruction of the social order, uh, which has held us to get together, threatens to undo us. So we have a couple of choices in response to that. Um, one is to slide into legalism. Legalism in response to the breakdown of the social order is mandating that everyone does the right thing um, through theological or, or legal penalties and then trying to enforce that. Legalism typically starts for the right reasons. So let me pick up a discussion that I, I, I started last week. Um, I, I used alcohol um, to talk about legalism. Um, and so as you observe that some people can't handle alcohol or, or some people get addicted to it or there are certain societal ills that, that come from the consumption of alcohol, which there are, um, we then, a legalistic, legalistic response says, well, well, no one can have it. Let's just ban it. Let's just get rid of it. And then we can start to construct theology um, which prohibits it. I also wonder... And um, I'm just thinking out loud here. Um, last week in, in, in my time, so June 21st, Drew preached an excellent sermon which highlights the dysfunction of King David's family. And I love the fact that the, the, the Old Testament and the New Testament are unvarnished. There's good and bad. David is not whitewashed. Although he is a man after God's own heart and he, he's held up as the ideal king, um, we don't hide the fact that, yeah, he had multiple marriages, his family was dysfunctional as, as all get out, and there were issues. There were issues that were passed on to his son and his son's son, right? Um, I wonder, in our world, if we're doing the same thing, and I shouldn't wade into the, the statute controversy, but here I go. It's too late. It's one thing to say, you know, a statue built in the 1930s by people trying to remind folks of racism and, you know, lift up a Confederate general who really wasn't that great a person. I understand removing those or, or, or putting them in a museum or something like that. But as a society, when we start to say, well, George Washington owned slaves and so we got to get rid of him and, and, and Teddy Roosevelt did this and so we got to get rid of him. I even wonder, are there those who are going to say, well, you know, Bill Clinton, we can't talk about him anymore because the Me Too movement were, were so much more enlightened or... You know, even Barack Obama, at one point, uh, he, he opposed gay marriage. And there are those who would say, well, you know, he opposed gay marriage. And so are they going to rip down his portrait at some point in the future? That's legalism. That's legalism. You get rid of anything that makes you uncomfortable, presents challenges. Or we can demonstrate community. That's a much more difficult way to handle things. Rather than shaming those who have experienced dysfunction and brokenness in their lives, we can model healthy community and relationships within the church. We've got our whole share, own share of dysfunction within the church, whether it be divorce or abusive relationships or addictions or whatever. So do we respond with legalism or do we respond with love and modeling how life can be different? We don't tear each other down. We spend time together. We invest time to concern in each other. We feed, we clothe, we visit. We build healthy community. And, and that ties into the next opportunity, which is closely related. And, and so the fourth opportunity is to value the community. And so I'm, I'm setting this um, in you know, kind of opposition to the fourth challenge, which is that individualism has, has kind of gone crazy. And so how do we value the community in a world where individualism is king? Well, we, we need community. We need people. We need healthy relationships and mentors. If we do um, the opportunity number three, um, and that is we lift up community, we then value it and we take this, this opportunity so much more seriously. I wanna speak for just a moment to those of you watching online 
or, or maybe those who are, are, are just not watching at all. And I'll talk about how we can talk to them in just a moment. Some of you are home because you have legitimate health concerns. I'm not talking about that. Or others of you, this is your first touch point with Beachside. You're, you're checking us out online. You've heard that there's this weird, bald preacher and this quirky little church at Bateson High School. And you're checking us out. Got it. And, and I hope that we can meet sometime in person. Others, that isn't what's going on. You've decided that it's easier to not be in community. It's easier just to be at home and, and, and watch on, on, on your computer or on TV. Or Others just aren't doing anything Sunday mornings. You just have gotten used to doing something else and, and you're not going to hear this sermon firsthand. But here's the thing. If we're truly valuing community, understand it, it isn't about you. This community is about God first and foremost. And then we, in relationship with God, are in relationship with each other. So we have a couple obligations. The first obligation is to prioritize community. Let me say that again. The first obligation is to prioritize community. We need each other. Church is more than just watching online. It's a great touch point and it's a great um, opportunity when, when, when you can't be with us in person. But absent that, we need to be together if we're going to do life together. Zoom and FaceTime is great. Those are, are, are incredible opportunities, but they're not substitutes. I can and have FaceTime my family frequently from Germany. It doesn't replace being there. Being together means so much more. We, we have to get together. And the second obligation then, you have to prioritize community, but you have an obligation. Everybody's listening to this. You have an obligation to reach out to those who've fallen away. Is the pastor's job? Absolutely. But it's your job. This is a job of those who are listening. You have an obligation, a commitment. You have that to those who aren't around, who aren't here who aren't with you in worship. And again, we're not talking about those that can't be there right now because of health crisis. We're talking about those who are out for a run or, that's me, um, golfing or boating or sleeping because they've just kind of fallen away. That's your obligation. To reach out to them and let them know you miss them, you love them and, and, and want to see them around this place. That's the opportunity. As we come out of COVID, certain institutions are going to struggle. They may not disappear, but they're going to struggle. Many people are, are going to start watching sports on TV. I, I didn't renew my, my Jaguar season tickets this year because it just seemed like too much of a pain. It's already, with all the security measures in place, it's difficult enough to get to the games. And then now we have the uncertainty of are they going to have games? Are there going to be masks? How are they going to be social distancing? I'm not saying I need it. But right now, we are in a time and a place where we're saying we need social distancing. So I don't know how they're going to cram 50,000 people in this stadium that's already overcrowded and, and mandate spacing. So for me, I'm going to watch more sports on TV. Some people are going to work out at home, or, or maybe there's going to be more takeout food ordered. Church, we can't do this. We can't do this. We have to demonstrate how much we value community. The fifth opportunity, then is the opportunity to share Christ. I talked about the fifth challenge being that we pervert the gospel. The fifth opportunity then is that we share Christ. This one's tougher because it, it, is, it, it isn't something that happens overnight. It requires time, commitment, and personal study. Faith has to be more than sharing Facebook photos that you like, that has a teaching or a Bible verse that reconfirms what you already believe. Do you know that when you share scripture, even those pictures and Bible verses sometimes aren't right. Yeah. I've seen pastors share photos of Scripture on it, and they are actually the words in the Scripture. We'll say, like, whatever. You know, God will never give you more than you can handle. Pastors, I don't think, are showing that. But, you know, just for example, you know, uh, God will never give you more than you can handle. Uh, Genesis 15, 6. And then you look up, and it doesn't actually say that. Um, I recently saw that one pastor, pastor, had posted with a verse that didn't sound right. It just, they posted it and it, it sounded close. That, that just doesn't sound right. I don't, I don't know the Bible memorized, but something felt off or funny about that Bible verse. And, and, and I looked up and sure enough, it was wrong. Friends, that's on you. If you don't know what you believe or what the Bible teaches and, and, and what is gospel, um, what is biblical versus man-made teaching, you have to look in the mirror. 
A 30-minute sermon on a Sunday will not fix that. This is where we do community. This is where we worship. This is where we love each other. This is where we collectively study. But your faith, the totality of your faith, does not hinge upon this sermon. It's a great starting point, but it doesn't hinge upon this. Think about the opportunity, though. People are hurting. They have questions. And we can either share the love of Christ with them or give them a watered-down, secularized, Americanized, pseudo-gospel, which panders to what they want to hear. That doesn't challenge them, but just tells them what they want to hear. Uh, it tells them that God wants only good things for you. He wants puppies and kittens and, you know, flowers and bright colors. And nothing bad will ever happen. And, and, and Jeremiah 29, 11, um, God knows the plans he has for you. And they're only going to prosper you and only be good, going to be good things. That's not, that's not real. That's not the gospel. And that certainly isn't sharing Christ. These are challenging times. But they're also times of opportunity to be the church to share what Christ is, to share community, to step forward and to be a calm, strong presence in our community. So I'm challenging you to be that. I can't wait to, to share that with you. God willing, next Sunday, so it's July 12th right now it, it, as you're watching this. So I might be there July 19th. At this point, no promises. Um, I'm not going to surprise you, as Rusty said, what, on the June 21st, I'm not going to parachute from the ceiling. Zip, that would be cool to zip line from the ceiling, have a smoke machine zip line down. Um, Mike, if you can make that happen technologically, I, I actually, maybe I will do that. But it's, it, I'm not going to surprise you. Um, by the time this airs, I'm, I'm actually going to probably know more of my timeline. Um, in fact, Rusty may have already announced, yeah, he's not going to be back on July 19th. Or he may step after the, stand up after the sermon and go, yeah, what he said was wrong. No, he, he's not going to be back next Sunday. I don't know. It's Tuesday, June 23rd here. Um, and so I might have left this weekend. We'll see. And if so, I hopefully we'll see you. And if I haven't left, guess what, Rusty? You are preaching next Sunday. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, well, not really. Um, Y'all need to figure that out. Um, assuming I am there. Um, I'm going to spend some time next Sunday talking about the lessons I learned uh, from this past year. And I'm going to share some pictures from the past year. And then the following week, I'm going to begin a, a series called Costly Discipleship, um, based on Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of Discipleship. So that's sort of a, um, you know, that's a spoiler alert. If you you have time to order that book, if you want to order it, it is um, not an easy read. Um, it's not, it's not, you know, impossible to read. It's just that it's not a book that you read in, you know, three hours and, you know, okay, got it. Um, it, it's a, a challenging read, but we're going to begin a sermon series based on that. Um, until then, God bless you all. Um, I, I love you. I miss you. Um, we're going to have a word of prayer. And then uh, we're going to turn it back over. I'm going to turn it back over to Rusty um, as worship goes live again. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to look at um, not just the challenges we have, but also the opportunities to um, be your church in this time and place, to be your hands and feet, to, to be you, to, to a world that desperately needs to know you. And so, Father, make concrete these opportunities. Help us to live out our faith in, in ways that are passionate and focused, um, vibrant, alive, um, and um, uh, desperately needed in a world that, that is hurting right now and uh, um, really doesn't have a shared sense of values or a, a shared idea of where we go next. So, Father, be with us and guide us and help us to be the church. In Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. Amen. God bless you guys, and I'll see you soon.